Okay. Uh, Fitra, I have to be this side in front of the camera, right? That's or roughly it doesn't matter. I can just go around. Okay. All right. Sounds great. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, the title of my talk is. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm not good with this. Right. The title of my talk is Entropy Driven Assembly of Colloids. Um, and I'm very happy and honored to be giving this talk at the Hands-On Research in Complex Systems. And as Petro had mentioned, that I was one of the students in the first hands-on school back in 2008 in India. And uh, this is Harry, myself, and others looking at a bouncing jet. Uh, in addition to the school, you know, the school was a wonderful opportunity for me to learn the scope of the field, uh, and it really got me excited and uh, continue with research in this area. But it has also made me really famous by becoming part of figure seven in this paper. And it's a paper in Animal Reviews of Fluid Mechanics, which talks about how to take fluid mechanics to the public. All right, going back to the talk. So the outline of my talk is about, uh, I'll start by discussing what colloidal dispersions are what are colloidal particles and how do they interact with each other and how these interactions lead to assembly of ordered phases like crystals and partially ordered phases like liquid crystalline phases. And then um, I will discuss how entropy can be utilized to assemble two-dimensional membranes from hard rods. And then um, I will discuss how using chirality as a, as a tool we can uh, assemble really exquisite uh, self uh, uh, phases uh, with colloidal particles. So uh, colloidal dispersions are uh, everywhere around us. Uh, we have these materials or uh, dispersions that we use every day in our life, starting with paints, inks, and milk. Opal is uh, really a colloidal crystal, so it's a crystal made out of uh, colloidal particles, and we'll talk more about this as we go along. So essentially, a colloidal dispersion is made out of micron-sized solid particles suspended in a solvent. So for example, ink has these colored pigments or nanoparticles uh, put in, a, in water or something like that. And the micron scale is really special because at that scale, Brownian motion becomes really important. And thermal fluctuations ensure that all these particles are uniformly suspended in the solvent. So another theme in the area of colloidal research is to use these particles as model atoms. So chemists have, go, have become really good at making colloidal particles, which all of which have the same size. So that property is called monodispersity. That means all the particles have the same diameter, same surface properties, and so on. And if you put some of these in water and look at them under the microscope, uh, and that's, that's really easy because the micron length scale can be simply visualized with an optical microscope. Uh, what you would find is that they jiggle around in, in, the, in water due to Brownian motion. And the time scale of motion is in millisecond. So you, don't, you need really simple cameras to look at that. The advantage with colloidal particles is that one can change the, the interaction potential between them and have them mimic some of the interaction potentials that are relevant in atomic systems. The advantage here is because of larger length scales and slower time scales, we can access the same similar physics what you would access in atomic systems, but far more easily and with far more detail. So let's look at what are the interactions that exist between two given colloidal particles that universally exist. And the first one is Van der Waals. I'm sure we've heard all of you must have encountered Van der Waals at one point or the other. Uh, it's, it's, an, it, it's an attractive force that exists between any pair of atoms, uh, uh, even if they are neutral. And so the idea is that uh, fluctuations induce dipoles in atoms. So the positive nucleus and electron, if they are separated, that leads to a dipole. And then two neighboring atoms act as a pair of dipoles and interact with each other through an attractive force which goes less minus 1 over r to the power 6. So it's a really short range force because it's going as 1 over r to the power 6. And it's fairly weak if you are to think about Van der Waals interactions between two atoms. But if you are uh, worried about Van der Waals between 
to macroscopic bodies, what we need to do is to sum up the interactions between all pairs of atoms in each of the two bodies. And then the interactions become significant and longer range. So what that means is that if you have two macroscopic plates at a separation of few nanometers, they, ex they experience a force per unit area of 10,000 atmospheres. So at that scale, thermal fluctuations are way too weak to overcome this attractive force. Uh, and that's what exactly happens with colloidal particles if there are no other repulsive forces. If the only force that that's exists between colloidal particles is van der Waals, they will all stick to each other eventually. And now they are big enough to sediment. And, and that leads to what is called instability of the colloidal dispersion. So if we want a uniformly suspended colloidal dispersion, we need to introduce some kind of repulsive interactions. And one of the ways to do that is to use electrostatics. So the idea is that we graft charges on these colloidal particles, and similar charges repel each other. So if I have only a single electron charge on a particle, and they're separated by a micron, it's too weak. The interaction energy for such colloidal particles is only about a kBT, so thermal fluctuations would be good enough to overcome this repulsion. And so what we need to do is to graft many more charges and then put them in uh, nonpolar solvents to enhance the uh, electrostatic repulsion energy. Typically, if we have put in the colloidal particles in an aqueous solvent, another very important phenomena takes place, which is that uh, there are counter ions in water. So if, if the colloidal particles are negatively charged, the positively charged ions in the water rushes towards these particles and uh, arrange themselves in a layer-like geometry. And this, what this layer really does is that it effectively neutralizes the charges on the colloidal particle. And so instead of having a 1 over r kind of potential, what we end up having is e to the power minus r over lambda by r. So the potential experienced, uh, the electrostatic potential from a given colloidal particle exponentially decays out with a screening length that is about 10 nanometers if you have a millimolar of sodium chloride in there. Um, an, um, a second way to introduce repulsion between colloidal particles is to uh, use uh, polymers. And essentially, here the idea is that we will graft polymer, part, polymer chains on the colloidal particles. And this leads to some kind of steric stabilization. So what's, um, and, and uh, in the community, people have used standard polymers like polymethyl methacrylate, but also there's an interest in using novel polymers like DNA. Uh, uh, and the advantage with DNA is that uh, you have these complement, base pair complementarity that can be used to uh, introduce at effective attractions. So, so if you have a polymer brush uh, uh, grafted on these particles and, the po and these particles are suspended in what is called a good solvent. What the, by a good solvent, what I mean is that the chains of the polymer are extended in the solution. When two such particles come close enough, what's happening in this area is that you have a very large concentration of polymer chains and therefore a higher osmotic pressure that, int that introduces an effective repulsion between the colloidal particles. Uh, and if, we, if the polymer brush is in a bad solvent, in which case the polymers would rather be among themselves than be with the solvent, that leads to enthalpic attractive interactions. So having discussed these uh, standard interaction potentials, uh, let's look at uh, a model system which is called hard spheres. So a hard sphere interaction potential shown here is a very simple interaction potential. It's zero until the particles touch, and it becomes infinitely large as the particles touch each other. Uh, this is the simplest interaction potential that one can cook up and analyze theoretically as well as experimentally. And this is how John Dalton had imagined uh, atoms to be. So if I look at the free energy of such a system, the free energy is given by internal energy minus T times entropy. 
And here the internal energy is purely kinetic because the potential energy stays zero. Um, and uh, uh, the only, only energy lens, energy scale in the system is KBT, so U is given by number of particles times KBT, and 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 so the free energy, the temperature really scales out. So what this expression shows you is that if you want to lower the free energy of the system, you have to maximize the entropy. So phase with the largest entropy has the lowest free energy, and that's the phase that one would obtain in equilibrium. So there is this usual notion that entropy is a measure of disorder. And so one would imagine that uh, for a hot particle system, ordered phases don't exist. But that's not quite true. And in fact, um, that was a really big question. Do hot spheres crystallize in the 50s? Uh, and at one of these conferences, the very famous people participated to debate over this question. and. Uh, they, they go around saying, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, it really goes against intuition because many uh, simulation and computational people had indeed found a phase transition for hot spheres to uh, go from a fluid phase to a crystalline phase beyond a certain volume fraction. And so there was a lot of uh, controversy about whether that is really an artifact of simulations or it really takes place. And eventually, uh, after all of this debate, they actually say that, oh, no, this is really too hard, so let's abandon the scientific method and just vote it out amongst themselves. So uh, they just voted, and uh, the vote was 50-50, so half the people thought that it's an artifact of simulations, and half the people thought that hard spheres can indeed crystallize. Uh, well, now it's very well understood. We have uh, very large computer power, and we can uh, do simulations to actually plot out the phase diagram. So this is how the phase diagram looks. So below a volume fraction of 50%, the colloidal uh, dispersion is in a fluid phase. What that means is that the, the particles are arranged in a completely disordered manner. And then above 50%, the crystalline phase sets in, where all the particles are arranged on a hexagonal lattice or a uh, or an ordered lattice. And this uh, is, uh, can be uh, intuitively, it, it's counterintuitive that crystal phase has higher entropy than fluid phase. But uh, you can get a sense of it by uh, considering, let's say, uh, a volume fraction of 64%. So entropy is proportional to number of accessible states. right? And so um, if I were to pack spheres in a random, in a completely disordered manner, the highest packing fraction I can achieve is 64%. But if I were to pack the same spheres in a crystalline arrangement, I can have a packing fraction of 74%. So that tells you that the number of accessible states for a crystal are way higher than for, for a disordered phase. Yes? T is temperature, and temperature is uh, plays no role in this transition, so the phase diagram stays the same all throughout, so y-axis has no role, really. Um, and so, the, um, so after this phase diagram was put out, uh, the question was that, can we see this experimentally? And in a beautiful experiment by Pusey and et al., they, um, they prepared hard sphere colloidal particles uh, by grafting a very small polymer brush. And so in, in, this, uh, in this picture, what you're looking at are vials which have these uh, hard, hard sphere colloidal particles uh, put in at different volume fractions. And then uh, after equilibration, what you find is the following. So, so these vials are backlit with white light. And what you're getting in, in the 50% volume fraction is some kind of iridescence. And what's going on is that you have crystals made out of micron-sized objects. And so the wavelength of visible light, which is about half a micron, is undergoing Bragg diffraction and giving you these beautiful colors. Um, so having looked at hard spheres, uh, what I would like to now show you is that, uh, that the geometry of the colloidal particle plays an important role in the kind of phases that we can assemble. And so the farthest away you can go from spheres is the most anisotropic object, a rod. And unlike hard spheres, where the chemists really knew how to synthesize uh, highly monodispersed particles, the situation with rods is quite grim. Uh, 
in the sense that we don't know how to synthesize uh, rods which who, who have identical lengths and diameter. And so physicists resorted to using viruses, and uh, in particular tobacco mosaic viruses. Uh, these viruses are engineered by nature to be monodispersed because the viruses, all viruses have, are identical to each other uh, and they have very high aspect ratio. So the aspect ratio of the rod governs the phase behavior and they have uniform surface properties. So in a beautiful experiment by Bernal, uh, what he did was he took a very dilute TMV solution about 0.1% TMV in a fish tank and examine the fish tank in cross polarizers. Um, and so basically he has this goldfish that is swimming in a dilute TMV solution and what you find is that away from the fish in the cross polarizer regime you don't have any signal. So if you have an isotropic uh, a uniform refractive index material and you observe it between cross polarizers you are expected to observe uh, dark, dark signal, but what this fish is doing is actually through its flow fields, it's aligning these rods, and once you have a, a, a area where the rods are com completely aligned, it's, uh, it's optically anisotropic. So the refractive indices along the axis of the rod becomes different from the perpendicular to the axis of rod, and that makes it birefringent and gives you signal even under cross polarizers. Um, and and uh, what really is exciting about hard rods is that as you increase the volume fraction of rods from 0.1% to say a few percent, uh, what you observe is uh, two-phase coexistence. So in a while which has to begin with 1% of uh, hard rods, they phase separate into two phases, which if you examine under cross polarizers, the top part is lighter in density and has no signal, and the bottom part is heavier in density and uh, gives you uh, strong birefringence. And so the top phase is what is called an isotropic phase, where the rods are both positionally and orientationally disordered. On the other hand, the bottom phase is called the pneumatic phase, where still there is no positional order, but there's orientational order, meaning all the rods are roughly pointing along the same direction. Whereas in the isotropic phase, the, the rods can point in any direction. Um, so, so Ansaga really got interested in this problem as to how isotropic to pneumatic phase transition takes place in hard rods. And in a way, it's a much simpler problem to analyze because the phase transition is happening at a volume fraction of few percent, unlike spheres where the phase transition took place at 50 percent. So uh, what Ansavir did was he expanded the free energy as, uh, in terms of, uh, as a virial expansion in density, and he has two terms. First is entropy of mixing, uh, which is basically um, translational uh, entropy, and then he has the second term, which encodes the orientational entropy. And so what's really happening is that by, f by, f uh, by forming a phase where you have uh, where you have lost orientational entropy or orientational disorder, but you have gained a lot of translational entropy. So at the expense of uh, orientational entropy, we have gained translational entropy, and therefore the pneumatic phase becomes stable. And this transition is sensitive to the aspect ratio L over D, um, because if you look at the excluded volume in the pneumatic phase, it scales as d squared L, whereas in the isotropic phase, it's d L squared. And so if I take the ratio of that, that tells me which one will be more favorable. Um, so TMV is, uh, is, a, uh, is a cool virus to work with, but um, is also very difficult to synthesize. So it's a plant virus where you have to grow the plants for four months and then hope to purify TMV out of it. Uh, a new system that I have been working, I and others have been working for a long time now, is uh, what is called an FT virus. It's a bacteriophage, so it infects bacteria. And so you can just grow up E. coli and purify within a day or so. So that's a huge uh, help that we can get virus in a day's time rather than over months time scales. Uh, it's a completely um, non-pathogenic virus. It infects 
laboratory strains of E. coli um, and it is chemically homogeneous. It's highly monodispersed and also it has much higher aspect ratio than TMV. TMV has an aspect ratio of 16, FT has an aspect ratio of 150. And so it's a virus which is one micron in length and few nanometers in diameter. Uh, and in a beautiful paper by Freden, uh, what they did is they figured out the isotropic pneumatic coexistence as a function of ionic strength. And the experimental data had a beautiful uh, overlap with the Onsager's theory of hard rods. So these rods are truly uh, hard rods. So it has quantitative agreements with uh, Onsager's theory. So when you increase the volume fraction of rods even beyond the pneumatic phase, what you end up getting is a symmetric phase where you have layers of, uh, of rod-like particles where the rods are arranged as shown. And, and this phase was pre first predicted in computer simulations by Frankel and then experimentally observed in FD viruses. And the advantage here is that the rod is one micron length scale, and so we can also do, do uh, single particle studies in these phases. So, so far, what I have shown you is that um, we can make three dimensional structures, both with hard spheres and hard rods. But if you were interested in making two-dimensional structures, the situation is a little bit uh, non-trivial. And so most people think about uh, membranes when they think about two-dimensional structure. And one of the ways, standard ways, that our body and, and uh, you know, chemists alike use to make uh, self, uh, self-assembled membranes is to use amplifiers or surfactant-like molecules, which have a hydrophobic head and a hydrophilic tail. And if you have many such, part, many such particles, they would, uh, in water, they would spontaneously assemble in these sheet-like geometries so that the hydrophobic tails are shielded from the unfavorable solvent. And so now what I'm going to show you is how we can assemble two-dimensional membranes starting with homogeneous hard rods instead of heterogeneous surfactant-like molecules. Um, and, and to do that, I'm going to use what is called depletion attraction. Um, and the, the, essentially, the reason I need to use depletion attraction is that the viruses by themselves are electrostatically repulsive, so they do not uh, really form ordered phases at low concentrations. And so what we really do, do here is to mix these rods with polymeric coils. And the idea is that each such polymer coil is excluded from a zone around the rod. And if two rods come closer than a coil diameter apart, then some free volume is available for the polymer coils, which increases the entropy of the polymer coils. And here, the number of polymer coils are way larger than the number of rods. So it's the entropy of the polymer that really matters, and therefore favors uh, alignment of rods. So the excluded volume zone overlap is uh, maximum when the rods are aligned along their axis. And it's a generic uh, mode of attraction where the polymer concentration sets the strength of the attraction and the polymer size sets the range of the attraction. Um, and so what's going to happen is that if I have uh, two rods and I, I add polymers, they come together and get aligned along their axis and then more rods will join to form these disk-like structures, right? So basically, the rods are joining the initial cluster of two rods. And now these disks themselves will undergo depletion attraction to stack up on top of each other and give you a phase which looks like a bulk symmetric. However, at low polymer concentration, what's going to be happen is that the rods will now fluctuate up and down from the disk. and um, and, and therefore, if I bring in two such disks at low polymer concentration, this, these protrusion fluctuations will be suppressed and lead to an effective repulsion between the disks. If I'm at the high polymer concentration, the protrusion fluctuations are not allowed. So I have really very two smooth disks that undergo depletion attraction and uh, stack up on top of each other. So, uh, so at low enough polymer concentrations, uh, this is how the assembly kinetics works out. So as I mix rods and polymers together, I make many such disks of aligned rods. And this is how they look under the microscope. So from the top, they appear as a circle. 
and from the size they appear as an ellipse. And if I have two such uh, disks, they coalesce and make a larger disk. So in the end, I can uh, end up with really large disks, tens of microns in diameter, one rod length thick. Uh, and on a good day, on a good sample, this is how it looks like on the cover slip, lots of these sheets. And here, uh, I'll switch to fluorescence where one out of 10,000 rods are labeled. And the rods are pointing at us, so they appear as dots. And they freely diffuse within these sheets. So these sheets or membranes are very similar to lipid bilayer in the sense that the constituent uh, rods or molecules are free to diffuse within the sheet, and they have long wavelength elastic properties that are similar to those of lipid bilayers. So, um, so far, I have shown you that we can uh, hard spheres and hard rods assemble in fluid and crystalline phases, and I can use depletion attraction to assemble two-dimensional membranes with hard rods. And now I'm going to give you examples of how I can use the chirality of the viruses to control the line tension of these sheets and uh, assemble what are called colloidal rats. Um, so I'm left with like 10 minutes for 45 minutes barrier. Um, and so let's go quickly. So. If I were to, uh, and I'll, I'll explain by chirality exactly what do we mean. But first, let's look at the edge of the membrane. So there are two possibilities. At the edge, the rods could be perfectly aligned. And that would give me a square edge. And that, that is quite uh, implausible in nature. There is, nature never really likes sharp edges. And what really happens is that we have a rounded edge where the, um, the rods are tilted. And the reason we have a rounded edge is because of surface tension with the surrounding polymer solution. Yes? Do you see that when you do the process? Do you see that as the dots uh, lying yes, down? Yes, when it's yes, in the edge? yes, I will show. Um, so, so this is a fluorescence micrograph where 1 out of 10,000 rods are labeled. So in the center, the rods are pointing at us. And there are dots. And at the edges, the rods are lying along in the xy plane. So you can see the entire rod. This is about a micron. And um, so essentially, what's happening is that this membrane itself is um, optically birefringent. So within the bulk of the membrane, the refractive index is the same in the x and the y direction. But the edges, it's not true. And so if you were to look at it schematically, this is what is happening. The rods are standing straight in the bulk and tilted at the edges. And if I measure uh, uh, the polarization uh, of such a system using what is called a pole scope, uh, the, so in this picture, the intensity is proportional to the local tilt of the rod. So I have huge tilt at the edges and no tilt in the center of the membrane. And one can write simple Frank free energy models to, uh, to analyze this phenomena. And this phenomena of expulsion of twist to the edges is, has one-on-one -on -one analogy with how a superconductor expels a magnetic field. And so the twist penetration depth uh, is about half a micron, and the penetration depth does not change with assembly conditions. Uh, and if we notice the dynamics of the edges, so here I have zoomed on to the edge of a colloidal membrane. What we find is that the edges are fluctuating, and they're fluctuating just like any other uh, liquid droplet would fluctuate. So it has a certain surface tension associated with it. Because I'm taking a 1D cut, it's a line tension. And uh, one can analyze these fluctuations to measure the line tension. So essentially, what you do is you break up the, the uh, height of this contour in a Fourier series. And then the, the uh, mean square fluctuations of the Fourier modes are inversely proportional to the line tension. Uh, and um, what we can do is we can control this line tension by tuning the chirality of the rod. So by chirality, what I mean is that the two rods don't want to be perfectly parallel with respect to each other, but instead prefer angle with respect to each other. So instead of making a perfect pneumatic, these rods make what is called a twisted pneumatic, where the director continuously turns. Um, and so if I plot the 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 preferred tilt angle versus the temperature, what I find is that these rods become achiral as I increase the temperature. Um, 
and so if I if I plot the line tension as a uh, as a function of temperature, what I find is that uh, that it uh, drops off as I lower the temperature. So in in this movie, uh, what we are doing is that we have a membrane, uh, and we are changing the chirality of the rods by lowering the temperature. And what's going to happen is that the line tension uh, continues to decrease, and so the fluctuations increase, and eventually there is a polymorphic transition into ribbons. Uh, and, and the reason one gets twisted ribbons is, is the fact that, um, that rods would really like to be tilted with respect to each other, and they're free to twist at the edges. And so basically, we want to generate as much uh, edge as possible. So what's going to happen is, yeah, it's fluctuating more and more. And then eventually it would uh, turn into twisted ribbons. And so twisted ribbons is basically small membranes that are now uh, connected to each other through these bridges. And, and, uh, and with such high surface area structure, the rods have as much twist as, uh, as they, they could ever uh, ask for. And it's completely reversible. We can go back and forth from the membranes to, to ribbons. So, um, so far, um, the data that I've shown you was from my postdoctoral lab, uh, Zwan, uh, Professor Zwani Medojic at Brandeis University. Um, and this is the data that I acquired while I was a postdoc in his lab. So the problem that I was interested in is, uh, is related to lipid rafts. Sorry. So, uh, so in a cell membrane uh, is made up of uh, hundreds of different types of lipids and proteins. And it is known that certain lipids and proteins associate within the membrane to make what are called lipid rafts. And these are highly controversial because the length scale of these rafts is few nanometers. They fluctuate where, uh, a lot. And it's not clear why they are stable. Uh, and so uh, to mimic this problem in the colloidal membrane system, uh, we decided to add a second rod, which is slightly shorter than the rest of the rods. And so there are two possibilities. The two kinds of rods can be uniformly mixed, or they can be completely demixed. And that's understandable purely on the basis of depletion attraction, because in this case, the excluded volume is, uh, maxim is, is minimized uh, as much as possible. And here, I'm actually uh, dominated by entropy of mixing. So when we did this experiment, uh, uh, we did it with rods, which are different in length by about 26%. They were oppositely handled and slightly different in flexibility. So uh, I will come to each one of them, why oppositely handled is required, and so on and so forth. But when we did this experiment, uh, we found the uniformly mixed phase. So from now onwards, all fluorescence movies, only shorter rods are labeled and longer rods are, are not labeled. So you have two kinds of rods, but in the fluorescence images, you can only visualize one kind of rods. And so here, you have uniformly mixed rods. And then at higher polymer concentration, the shorter rods have completely phase separated within a background of longer rods. And in the fluorescence, only the shorter um, rods glow up. So what was really interesting is what happens in between these two limits. And what happens is the following, that uh, we observe these clusters of uh, shorter rods in a membrane of longer rods. These clusters have a very well-defined size of about 2 microns. And you can wait a day, a week, or months. The two clusters will not merge. So they repel each other strongly, and, so, and they are self-limited. So uh, schematically, what you're looking at is a sheet which has these two dimples made out of shorter rods. And so these samples were made by mixing the two kinds of rods first and then adding the depletant. So a question that, a natural question that, that arises is that, is it the true ground state of the system or is it a kinetically arrested metastable state? Meaning the two clusters cannot merge because the repulsive forces are really large. Or is it that the system would really prefer to have many, many clusters? And so to answer that question, uh, we did the following experiment where I took a sheet made out of purely shorter rods and a sheet made out of purely longer rods under the same polymer concentration and have them merge. This way, I would start out with a bulk interface. And 
this is what happens. So indeed, uh, now I have a clear interface between the shorter and the, in the longer rods. And it looks like that nothing much is happening. Um, although I would not be showing you this movie if nothing much was going to happen. So uh, let's see what happens next. And this is what happens. The interface destabilizes into these clusters, which are connected by thin liquid bridges, which then break due to thermal fluctuations. And the system equilibrates itself into uh, these uh, clusters that, uh, uh, that are you know, stable and hang out in the lab, uh, in, the, in the membrane. So, so this really shows that the, the microphase separated state is, um, is the preferred ground state of the system. Um, and it's interesting to note that each of this cluster, which is about two microns in diameter, has about 24,000 rods. And it's highly monodispersed. And, and so what we have done here is we have taken 24,000 colloidal particles, put them together in a cluster of well-defined shape with an error bar of maybe 500 rods. And that's really a very sophisticated self-assembly, given the contrast in the colloidal sphere regime, where it's, real, it's a matter of great pride if we can put together four spherical particles in a tetrahedral cluster. And so this is a large membrane where uh, I'm showing you these uh, clusters of shorter rods. And we can see that they clearly interact with each other through repulsive interactions. And we can measure these interactions. So in order to know the origin of the interaction, I need to first measure it. And we measure it using uh, what, what are called optical traps. So the red dots are essentially focused laser beams, uh, which uh, push on these clusters like snow plows. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring these two clusters closer than what thermal fluctuations would allow me to do. And then uh, I would let the traps go. So this is what is happening. I'm coming in with focused laser beams. And then I'm uh, pushing them together. Um, and then I would let go. And once the traps are off, the, the particles in feel strong repulsive forces, and they drift apart. And by repeating this experiment many, many times, there is a way to back calculate uh, what is the true interaction potential. And this is how it looks. It's uh, really, uh, it's, it, an exponential fits really well to this. It has a characteristic length scale of half a micron, and it's strongly repulsive, so it, on contact, it would be hundreds of kbt. And so what, what sets the size of these clusters and what's the origin of repulsive interactions has to do with the fact that these rods are chiral. And so the half a micron length scale comes from the twist penetration depth. So if I look at the polarization image of these bidispersed colloidal membranes, what I find is that at the edges of the cluster, I have a preferential tilt of the rods. So essentially, by forming these clusters, I'm allowing the twist to penetrate the membrane interior and lower the chiral free energy of the rods. And that's why it is favorable for these clusters to form. And uh, they interact repulsively, because as I try to bring two clusters closer than the twist penetration depth, then the rods at the edges have to untwist. And that costs a lot of energy and leads to effective repulsion. Um, and if this hypothesis, and so we can, act, what we also observe is that shorter, smaller clusters have less twist associated with them than larger clusters. And we can quantitatively measure, uh, measure that to find that the peak, uh, the peak retardance or the maximum tilt angle as a function of the size of the cluster goes up. And the twist penetration depth stays the same. So if this understanding is correct, then I should measure the interaction potential between clusters of different sizes. And, uh, and we do that. And we find that, indeed, larger clusters repel more strongly than smaller clusters. And I can collapse the data with an experimental error by scaling with the experimentally measured tilt angle. Um, and uh, now I can use these repulsive interactions to hierarchically assemble larger, uh, uh, larger uh, crystals. And so essentially, at, uh, sorry. So at low volume fraction, the clusters are in a disordered uh, configuration. As I increase 
the uh, number density of smaller clusters, some short range order starts to set in. And then at the highest uh, volume, fra uh, highest number fraction, I get these beautiful cluster crystals. So in appearance, they look like colloidal crystals, but they are actually very different because here each cluster is also self-assembled, unlike uh, uh, you know colloidal crystals that are made out of, let's say, polystyrene beads. Um, and so what I have done is that I've shown you that we take uh, hard rods, we add polymers to get membrane-like structures to which we add a second uh, rod or second component to form analogs of 2D micelles, which I can then further self-organize to come back to colloidal crystals. So I've completed the circle in a way. And um, this is just to uh, emphasize that it's not that I took two rods that, that were um, highly designed to see all the phase behavior. So colloidal rafts are quite ubiquitous. We have changed uh, the relevant parameters, such as the length difference, the chirality, to get uh, a zoo of, of phases that I hope to explore in future. And I would now conclude that uh, I've shown you a number of phase transitions that are driven by entropy. And uh, we can engineer the colloidal interactions by uh, changing the, the geometry of the particle, the, the uh, chirality and the flexibility. And the, what colloidal lens scales really allow us to do is to directly visualize and manipulate with simple tools. And uh, the system of hard draws, chirality, and attraction has a complex, unexplored phase behavior. So with this, I will thank you for your time.